Uh, hello, uh, welcome. So we're here um, to celebrate our very own uh, Josh Chaffetz, uh, professor of law. His uh, wonderful new book, Congress's Constitution, Legislative Authority, and the Separation of Powers. We have a terrific um, panel assembled. I'm going to introduce all three now in the order that they're going to speak um, before providing uh, Professor Chaffetz with an opportunity uh, to respond, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, so our, our three um, panelists, first we have David Bateman here from the Government Department. He's Assistant Professor in the Government Department. Um, his focus is on American political development, Congress, political parties, ideology. Uh, he has a book project that he's in the process of completing entitled Disenfranchising Democracy that focuses on 19th century histories of democratization in the U.S., the U.K., and France. Uh, <clears throat> our second speaker is Curtis Bradley, who's the William Van Alston Professor of Law and Professor of Public Policy Studies at Duke University Law School. Um, Professor Bradley uh, Curtis is also the co-director of the Center for International and Comparative Law and has written extensively in international law, U.S. foreign relations, constitutional law, and has published innumerable articles in um, many different uh, legal venues and is currently wa working on a book tentatively titled History's Constitution, How Government, Governmental Practices Define the Separation of Powers. And then finally, we also have um, David Posen here, who's a professor of law at Columbia Law School and teaches and writes in constitutional law, national security law, information law, and many other uh, uh, topics. He's uh, currently the Knight First Amendment. He's currently at the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University as their inaugural visiting scholar, and he's also published extensively in uh, many venues. Uh, I'll mention um, a couple pieces that uh, I think are particularly noteworthy: the leak of Leviathan, why the government condemns and condones unlawful disclosures of information, in Harvard Law Review from 2013, which is a classic in the field, as well as constitutional bad faith, also in Harvard Law, Law Review. Um, so I'm going to turn it over now to, to David to begin the, the conversation. Hi. Does that work now? Cool. All right, so thank you very much for being here. I want to thank, uh, start by thanking Aziz and Josh for organizing this and for having me come out. I really look forward to hearing David and Kurt's remarks and to the sort of the discussion that will follow. So I've been looking forward to this book for a while now, and I just want to say right at the outset that I extremely enjoyed reading it. It's extraordinarily well written and gives the, the reader a wonderful sense of the politics of interbranch disputes, the stakes involved, and perhaps most importantly, they're often extremely public character, that these are disputes that are turned towards a public audience. And there are also sort of details, a distinct set of legislative powers and how these have developed over time. And this develops them from the Tudors, right, so in Tudor England, basically to today. And at each point, you're thinking this is extraordinarily interesting and going with, you're following the argument until you get to the point where I see now that this is a power that continues to sort of be a possible power that Congress can exercise. So on the one hand, it's extraordinarily valuable corrective to this idea that's sort of increasingly common that Congress simply does not have the ability, does not have the institutional powers to stand up, stand up to the other branches or that it is in some sense at a fundamental disadvantage relative to these branches. It's also an invaluable compendium of the powers they do have, their long-term constitutional development, and as well as a sort of a call, a normative call, as well as a principled and historical justification for why legislatures, legislators today should consider using the powers that Josh details in more aggressive, albeit judicious, ways. Most broadly, however, it encourages a new way of thinking about the separation of powers, one that emphasizes the multiple overlapping and non-hierarchical claims to authority that are made by the different branches but also their need to constantly engage in the public sphere, both because there is no ultimate arbiter of these disputes, but because this is, because the branches win more or less and accrue power by getting the public on its side. This is what I took to be, from my perspective, the most important contribution of the book. It's insistent claim that constitutional powers are politically constructed, and they're politically constructed by the relative effectiveness of different actors and branches in a dialectical process of responding to and persuading the public about the merits of its views. So I'm going to organize my comments and my questions today around three themes. The first is on this broader point, that argument, the argument that political power rests on the judicious engagement in the public sphere. The second concerns the relationship that uh, Josh frequently draws out between public engagement and trust in the different branches and the relationship of trust to political power. And the last 
question that I'm going to raise is something of a suspicion that perhaps you've not quite gotten to the nub of the question that you start off with, which is, what good is Congress? So that's how the book is started off, and I think that's where, I, where I'll end my comments. So my first set of comments concerns this idea of the engagement in the public sphere. So Josh writes, political power is largely endogenous to politics, and that the political actors who are the best public conversationalists and who are seen to back up their talk with consistent actions win power in the long run. Power, in this sense, power between the different branches, rests not on the constitutional text, but on public trust. And public trust is cultivated by a judicious engagement in the public sphere. And there's sort of a lot hinges on this word judicious, that you have to engage in the public sphere, but you have to do so in a way that is well calibrated. I think that this might be, or this is, I think, very Madisonian in its own way. Each branch is founded on or dependent upon popular sovereignty. Uh, in a spatially and temporally overlapping ways that are non-exclusive. No one branch necessarily or inherently represents the public more than any of the other branches. They must all compete for public approval in the pursuit of their own, their own ambitions. And the degree to which they're able to achieve this public approval and gain this support of the public is ultimately going to determine which of these is more powerful in the long run. I think that this is a sophisticated optimism. Uh, I mean sophisticated, it is not a Pollyannish argument, right? And Josh is very insistent that judicious engagement is the key term. The degree to which ambition checks ambition is always variable. It's always conditional on political context. And good God, we should hope that it should always be conditional on political context. The idea of branches indiscriminately trying to check the other in pursuit of their own ambitions is a recipe for disaster. That this is done in a judicious, thoughtful, and deliberate way is very important. But the argument that political power accrues to and success in interbranch conflict goes to those who can best engage the public can sometimes lead us to funny places. Take, for instance, the characterization of Merrick Garland's nomination to the Supreme Court. You are absolutely correct that Republicans, in refusing to hold hearings, did provide a public rationale, a principled rationale, to the public as to why they wouldn't do so. They said, we should let the people decide that there's an election coming up. But then this is true of every salient political conflict. There are talking points for a reason, right? They are meant to be sold to a public, even if that ultimately is not necessarily what determines their, their actions or their success. Yes, Obama and the Democratic Party also turned to the public to try and pressure Republican lawmakers. And yes, some of these Republican lawmakers did feel gradually pressured. And I don't doubt that the weight that was placed on this particular seat played an important part in silencing evangelical opposition to Trump and encouraging the Republican Party to sort of rally behind his nomination. But in the end, as you put it, the Republican leadership ultimately declined to hold hearings on Garland, a decision presumably based on its judgment that continued intransigence would not be particularly harmful to the party in the public sphere. So in this case, and very much in contrast to the Bork case, which is also outlined in detail in the book, judicious engagement in the public sphere takes the form of not engaging in the public sphere, in a way, by not holding hearings, by not airing the views of of Garland that they feel should not be, uh, should not be, do not warrant his nomination and warrant putting the question to the people. So basically Republicans in this case seem to have gotten what they wanted because they refused to engage the public. And democratic efforts to engage the public couldn't get all that much traction precisely because Republicans held the Senate and could decide if they wanted to simply not to do anything. As the course of the election, sort of, as the election built up, the democratic attention to Garland's pending nomination sort of seemed to wane. They didn't press it in part because they had been pressing it and not much traction had been gained, it seems to me. There are a few other instances in which you attribute success or failure in an interbranch dispute to the success or failure of engaging the public. For example, in the fight over the Reed rules in Congress, and this is sort of a wonderful piece of historical information, which if you read the book, you will learn much about. In the fight over the Reed rules, you note that Reed won both the policy and the politics. Democrats caved in and reinstated the Reed rules, and Republicans won the 1894 elections, returning the speakership to Reed. This seems to be a bit of a jump <laughs> between they opposed him, they took a case to the public, and the public responded by re-electing re the Republicans and reinstalling Speaker Reed. It might have to do with the fact that the Democrats were also presiding over a historic collapse in the world economy, uh, and that they were being held responsible for this. Or in the fight over election laws in 1876, you suggest Democrats miscalculated. So what happens here is the Democratic Party keeps trying to repeal federal election laws that protect the right to vote in the South. 
and President Hayes keeps vetoing it. And they go through, I think, like seven rounds of this or something. It's a highly contested issue, gets a lot of public attention. And yet, it's not entirely clear to me that the public is ultimately persuaded that Hayes was in the right on this and turned to Hayes. Hayes certainly feels this. But Democrats in their writings also feel this. Democrats are saying that our, our partisans believe this. They want us to continue on this. They want us to pressure on this. And Hayes is saying, Republicans, who never really trusted Hayes all that much, Republicans are backing me again. They're encouraging me. But there's no real sense to how a broader public, sort of, how a broader public had changed its position or what a broader public felt. And so the possibility here is that these different branches are responding to very, very different publics. Publics that have very polarized views about what should be done. And both are engaging the public. And that is not the determinant of policy success or failure. Ultimately, what determines it was that Hayes could keep vetoing and there was nothing they could do to stop that. <laughs> uh, so that the, the structural ability of the president to veto the legislation that was being passed and the inability of Congress to get a two-thirds majority to over, overcome that, that struck me as the more important aspect in that fight. And so ultimately, I wonder if the argument that successful engagement in the public sphere determines over the long run or who wins and loses and the accrual of power that comes with that, if it really holds. Or perhaps more, sort of more usefully, I would wonder, want to know under what conditions that this might hold. It's probably more true that this is the case than a total cynic would accept. I do think that there is a value to understanding these conflicts in terms of a public engagement. But is it true enough that we can rely on it generally in the way that you make a normative def principle defense of it in the conclusion? And base a normative defense of the separation of powers on the idea that successful engagement in the public sphere will ultimately determine the winner and losers over the long run. This relates to a second set of uh, questions that I have. At various points, you suggest that judicious engagement in the public sphere is a way of building trust in institutions, and that the branch that accrues the most trust will, on average, enjoy more power relative to the others. It's not simply engagement about persuading which institution is in the right on a particular fight, but about which institution is more trustworthy over the long run. I certainly think Congress can and should use the powers that, that Professor Chavitz outlines to build up trust. I don't buy the argument that has been made by many that Congress is at an inherent, inherent disadvantage in public trust. This is a common argument that, well, Congress is open and transparent and so you see the sausage being made in a way that you don't see the sausage being made in, in um, or that you don't usually see the sausage being made in the executive branch, for instance. <laughs> Maybe not the best analogy. Uh, an institution, so at one point you write, an institution that is able to deter, demonstrate trustworthiness to the public by performing well will find itself with a larger reservoir of trust and therefore more power. And you suggest that to the extent that Congress has engaged inartfully in the public sphere, it has thereby lost power. But it's not clear to me that Congress has all that much ability to change how it is perceived in the public and sort of the broader conditions of trust in institutions. There seems to be a generational, multi-generational now, decline in the degree to which we trust government and the degree to which we trust government institutions. It's clear also that Congress has taken the most severe beating. People trust the Supreme Court much more than they trust Congress. They trust the president, I believe, even, even today, more than they trust Congress. Congress is really at the bottom end, slightly above cockroaches and below Castro. Uh, so that it, it does, it's not very well perceived and it's not very well trusted. But this strikes me as something that's not entirely within Congress's control. If you sort of tally the, the declines in trust in Congress, it often, the major hinge comes in the 70s, which is exactly when Congress reasserts itself into the public role of overseeing the president. And so it's not obvious to me that Congress built up a, well, a reservoir of trust during this period that would overcome the generational decline in trust more broadly. And it certainly seems to me plausible now that in waging interbranch conflict, no matter how judiciously they do this, and as long as judicious doesn't simply have a post hoc meaning, which you say they won and so it was, must have been judicious, that it will only reinforce low opinions of all the branches. So engaging in oversight of the presidency might involve showing that the presidency is involved in various actions that we would not agree with, and that this might resound to the, to the detriment of the presidency. But it might also lead supporters of that president to look poorly on Congress itself, leading to a general decline in both institutions. So Congress's trust did not go up after its role in Watergate. Uh, and it seems to me one of the major drivers of distrust in Congress, apart from, 
apart from sort of a, a generational change, is that for the first time in a long time, the 1980s and the 1970s sees Congress being actually competitively contested. Congress had been under Democratic control for a long time before that. Before Democratic control, it was relatively stably under Republican control. But starting in the 80s, it was a genuine possibility that control of Congress would flip. That has led to a polarization of attitudes dependent on who's in charge of Congress, who runs Congress at a particular moment. So finally, I'm wondering whether or not you really answer the question of what good is Congress? So you're absolutely right to, I, I like that you start with what good is Congress because the question of what good is Congress is asked was in 1789. Uh, so it's right off the bat, people have a sense of Congress is not particularly great. And hating on Congress has been a long standing feature of American politics. Uh, and the answer, since at least Samuel Huntington, is usually to get some way out of it, we should make a more presidential system. Congress should step back. This is the argument that Terry Moe has been making recently. Congress should step back. The president should step in. And Congress should have a more or less a veto argument or a veto power and that the president should be given the initiative power. Uh, this might make it more like the French Constitution, the Fe French Fifth Republic Constitution, which I, I like to remind people Samuel Mitterrand had called the permanent coup d'etat. So the answer you give in this book is wonderful because it tells us that Congress does in fact have the ability to check the branches. Congress does have the capacity to do this. But that's not really the question raised by Huntington and that's not really the question raised in 1789 or by Moe and the others. The question is not so much does it have the capacity to do this but rather will it rise to the occasion? And ultimately, and here's where I'll conclude, I think one of the great values and strengths of this book is that there's no way that it's going to rise to the occasion if it doesn't feel it can, and if it doesn't know the ways in which it can. And ultimately, what, uh, what we have here is a book that provides exactly an outline of how they could do this, as well as a principle and historical justification for why they should aggressively use these powers. Thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to celebrate uh, Uh, to celebrate this great book. And um, so just to say a few things about uh, the book to echo what uh, David Bateman just described. Um, Josh in the book gives us an in-depth account of uh, the powers that Congress has, both hard powers and soft powers, that allows it to play a role in our system of checks and balances and also to manage itself. Um, the book is rich in history. I recommend if you haven't read it, you definitely read it. It's extremely engaging history informative. Um, it traces the evolution of uh, Congress's many powers back to the British system and then in early American history all the way up uh, to the present. Um, I think Josh convincingly shows that, um, among other things, Congress has uh, many powers that it can employ even outside of the obvious ability to pass um, legislation. Um, I learned a lot about uh, where a lot of Congress's powers come from and how they've evolved, often in fits and starts, often in response uh, to particular crises in American uh, or British history. Um, what I like most about the book, and if you, if you haven't read it, you'll find this when you do read it, that it uh, really has, it gives an infectious enthusiasm for the history of uh, Congress and uh, Congress as an institution. Um, there may be times where Josh's enthusiasm for the British history is a little bit more than my own. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, who doesn't want to read about people being thrown into the Tower of London? Um, so interesting and fascinating uh, book. And um, it challenges a core claim that's very prominent today, which is uh, that we really have had the development of an imperial presidency, Congress as a diminished actor, and uh, some people, as the last speaker noted, have called uh, for us to just to recognize this and to recognize we should have a more presidentialist system. And I think this book is an important counterpoint to that uh, viewpoint. Um, where I think uh, the book still runs into difficulties or, or issues that one would still need to think about uh, is what I would call sort of the modern structural realities of the Congress that we have. And these are realities that I'll describe in a minute are not easy to overcome. These are not realities that will change merely by efforts uh, to become more judicious, for example, something that uh, the book often uh, talks about. Uh, so let me say a few things about the structure of our Congress and why it's difficult to, to have a Congress move to a more optimistic place. 
So just obvious points. It, it's obviously not an it. There is no such thing really as a Congress in, the real, in a real sense. It is a very much a collective body, over 400 members of the House, 100 members of the Senate, uh, very different personalities, and importantly, two major political parties uh, in, the, in the membership. What this means is that, um, and this, of course, is true of any collective body, efforts by individuals to enhance the uh, prestige and the capacities of the institution uh, will benefit all of the membership. And therefore, unfortunately, there's a tendency uh, to free ride off of those efforts. And unfortunately, that means a tendency not to produce those efforts in the first place. This is a classic collective action type problem. And Congress, as a body that shares any institutional gains, is going to suffer from it. There are efforts, there are ways you can try to get around collective action problems, but Congress at least runs into that issue. Another feature of Congress is that the incentives of the individual members um, tend to be heavily focused, as you might guess, on re-election and relatedly satisfying the demands of local constituents. In our modern era, that means uh, in particular raising money all of the time and being back away from Washington, D.C. much of the time. And that has shifted over the course uh, of congressional history in, in such a way that for example, if you think that one way of building institutional loyalty and commitment is by being together and communing with each other uh, uh, over as, as, as institutional members, that's just a reduced phenomenon in the modern Congress. And also just as a matter of time, members of Congress don't have the time uh, that they might have otherwise had to put in institutional investments into the authority of their body. They're too busy raising money and focusing on various discrete policy questions. Um, so when they have all those competing demands in their time, uh, investing in the institution is just not sufficiently attractive to them for them to put in that effort, particularly when they have to share any gains with everybody else. Uh, now, the, another major addition to this picture is, of course, the party system. And um, we do not have to say that the parties have absolute control over the members, because they don't. But we do recognize that members have a great interest in working with the party, in part because the party is very important to their own re-election uh, interests and fundraising efforts. And um, party interests often won't necessarily align with institutional interests. Um, in fact, the last speaker was talking about the Garland uh, uh, situation. And the, thought, the ultimate conclusion of the Republicans is it wasn't hurting the party, is what you heard. It didn't particularly matter whether it was hurting the institution. And I think that's a much more common way of thinking in Congress. And then a final exacerbating factor, which everybody knows about, is that we now have hyper-polarized politics between the parties, where the number of moderates has diminished, the extremism in the parties has grown. Um, so one, one aspect of that is that it used to be your moderates, say in the Senate, for example, who would cross party lines to try to emphasize uh, issues about institutional authority in Congress. They're disappearing. And just even the last few weeks, we know that um, moderate conservatives in the Republican Party, like Corker and Flake, are leaving, in part because they don't want to run another primary race uh, in, this, in this polarized party environment. Contrast all of that with the presidency, and it's, of course, not exactly an it either. It's a massive bureaucracy. But it's much more of an it than Congress. Uh, the president is able to capture more of the gains from institutional investment than the legislative body is much more unitary in that sense. And here's a good example of this will illustrate that. Uh, probably many of you have heard of the Office of Legal Counsel in the Justice Department. Uh, this is a body dedicated to enhancing and watching out for executive power over the long term. So it suggests signing statements and legislation that will preserve, just lay down markers of executive authority. It uh, prompts the president to object to bills that might intrude, even in a long-term sense, on executive authority. It issues reasoned opinions, usually with the pro-executive tilt, that favors executive authority over the long term. There is no institution in Congress like that, and you're not going to see one develop. Why is that? The reasons I've already given. One, the members don't have sufficient incentive to invest in a body that's designed to enhance long-term institutional authority. And they have to they would have to manage two parties negotiating how to set up such an institution, and they wouldn't agree. They wouldn't benefit equally from it at any particular time. So you don't see any institutional counterpart 
to the very pro-executive and very influential Office of Legal Counsel. So just as one example, we don't have, in other words, to take uh, something that was said in the last uh, presentation, we don't have a Madisonian Congress. We don't have a Congress described by James Madison in the Federalist Papers where the members' institutional incentives would line up, uh, their members' individual incentives would line up with their institutional uh, uh, authority. Of course, it's not, we can think of some individual members of Congress who do champion the institution. I think they're becoming fewer and far between than uh, sometime in the past, but it does not describe your average membership in this collective body. Here's another example that highlights this. Uh, Josh's account would suggest, I think accurately, that Congress has an institutional interest in uh, being perceived well in the public sphere. Uh, that is because their ability to use these powers that he so well documents ultimately depends on politics and competitions in politics. Absolutely correct. But think about how, how Congress manages this. I looked, at, I looked at specific figures on Congress's approval ratings across all the major polls for the last two decades. Often below 10% approval ratings in every single year, depending on the poll, often over 80% disapproval ratings. They would love President Trump's approval ratings, which are astoundingly low for a president right now. They would certainly love the Supreme Court's ratings, which have actually dropped in recent years. If it's in Congress's interest to compete in this uh, sphere, why aren't they doing it? And it's not just a blip, it is a long-term phenomenon. They instead, of course, they do push back against the president. So a, a counter to what I'm saying sometimes is, well, look, they just fought uh, the president on Russia sanctions, for example. Trump or many times in the Obama administration, of course they fight with the president over context specific policy issues that are of interest to their constituents. There's no question about that. And that is a type of competition. It's just not competition over institutional authority. It also means that they do much less of that during times of unified government. So even if that's a type of check, if the president's party also happens to control Congress, you'll see much less of that, as you might expect, like right now. Although right now is a little bit unique, as I'll say in a minute. Now, Josh notes that we don't often have unified government. That's actually becoming not exactly true either. I looked, and about a third of the time since 2000, we've had unified government. So it's not that rare. Um, Josh also makes a very nice point in the book, which is maybe we don't need to worry about checks and balances as much when the public has so uniformly come behind one particular party. I'm a little bit skeptical of that point. Uh, I still worry about abuses of authority, even if uh, the policy agenda seems to have widespread public uh, support. But here's the bigger problem. Even in terms of divided government, where one or both houses is held by the other party, we actually don't have checks and balances very much either in the modern era. And part of the reason is hyper-partisanship has taken hold, and what we instead have is gridlock. And what this has led to is that presidents, which have a much more capacity to act unilaterally and find out the consequences later than Congress does, have simply bypassed the Congress, claiming in the public sphere, and of course they have a better ability to <coughs> appeal directly to the public than a collective body, that Congress is obstructionist, which, which it is, uh, and so it's quite a credible argument in the public sphere, and so the Obama administration moves ahead on immigration reform and climate change and the Iran nuclear deal, all important public policy measures, many of which you may approve of or I may approve of, but done entirely without the legislative branch, and um, we don't see checks and balances, we just see gridlock and presidential unilateralism. Now, the, and one other thing that I think the book probably could, could have taken more account of and I think is an important fact. So I think what a response to me might be, well, it varies. And we'll see times where maybe there's not very much checking and then there'll be a resurgence and I do agree with that. It's a, this, this varies over time. But we need to keep in mind that precedent and practice actually affect politics. So politics is not, doesn't just reset itself perfectly every time the alignment of the parties changes. If we have a pattern of practice, people's normative expectations about what the president can do or Congress can do actually shift over time and it changes our politics. So if we have low checks and balances because of the structural problems I'm describing, we end up producing more long-term changes in the power alignments between the branches that are not easily undone. 
you can call this, I've written about historical gloss, constitutional conventions, institutional acquiescence. The point is normative expectations about what the branches can do or should do change. So a couple of examples, and I think we can all uh, uh, identify with what's happened here. So take military, the use of military force. A uh, major, perhaps one of the most significant public policies the United States ever makes. You go to the founding, the founders did not want the president to have this authority unilaterally and gave Congress the power to declare war and actually a host of other powers over war. And President George Washington said many times, I know I have to work with the legislative branch, even for fairly minor expeditions against the Native American tribes. Fast forward, particularly after World War II, and almost all uses of military force are done unilaterally by the presidents. A couple major exceptions. As the practice builds up over time, it becomes much harder to say presidents are acting improperly by acting on their own. Take a dramatic example. It's hard to say that President Trump does not have the power to use unilateral force against North Korea in response to a possible nuclear threat when President Truman waged a several year massive fatalities campaign against North Korea without Congress in the 1950s. Many examples are like this, many in my area of foreign affairs, but also in domestic affairs, where a Congress that's for structural and collective action problems allows the practice of unilateralism to continue has actually created a new uh, uh, fact on the ground that makes it actually harder for the contestation of politics to work in the same way going forward. One other example that's also in the news. There should be a lot of dispute, and there will be some, about whether presidents can unilaterally just pull the United States out of important treaties and agreements like the NAFTA trade agreement, very much in the news. Well, President Trump's already announced we're getting out of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, threatened to pull out of NAFTA and other treaties. And these claims are much easier for him to make and harder for Congress to resist because for decades, presidents have simply unilaterally, often quietly, exercised this and Congress for structural and other reasons has done nothing to resist. And our law literally changes as a result of accretions of practice so that Congress even if it could reassert itself at some future point, is much less able to do so on this terrain. So that's my dismal uh, sense of the current Congress and uh, severe structural issues that I think make it hard to get to what I think we would all applaud, which is kind of an optimistic possibility for our legislative uh, branch. Maybe, I don't want to end on a completely pessimistic note, so I think it's possible, for example, that the Trump administration might present kind of unique conditions where you could see some resurgence of institutional interest in the Congress. Uh, that might be because, for example, the Republicans want to entrench certain institutional authority before the White House shifts back again. Uh, not necessarily the best of motives, but it would be a motive. Um, it might well be because of increasing scandals in the presidential administration. So the last presentation mentioned one of the last times we had major institutional reform in Congress was during the Vietnam War and Watergate. If we see something like that, it could produce another big transformational effort in Congress for institutional reform. And uh, so I think it's possible that the conditions might align that we would see some resurgence. Um, not entirely optimistic, time obviously will tell. Um, my last thought though, to return to something I very much like about the book, which is we can't um, uh, even have the possibility of a more optimistic role for Congress unless we can imagine it. And one of the things I love about the book is that it imagines a more well-functioning Congress, partly in appealing to some better uh, aspects of history. And if nothing else, I think the book's a great corrective to our own collective kind of pessimism and my own and our collective imagination. I would love it if it were a corrective to Congress's own imagination uh, but in any event, I applaud Josh's effort to appeal to our better natures. Thank you. Hi. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here anchoring the, the bearded sweater side of uh, <laughs> the commentariat. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so. I will try not to be too duplicative of the prior remarks, though I'd like to associate myself with them. Uh, I think they're quite 
uh, illuminating and track my views. Um, I would say, I'm gonna, I, I can't help but call Professor Chaffetz Josh, having known him for a while, so uh, forgive me that. Um, I would say Josh, even before this book, was already quite clearly uh, the leading constitutional scholar of Congress uh, in our midst. Um, and this book substantially deepens and extends his scholarship in that area, um, making him in, really indisputably uh, our leading uh, constitutional uh, theorist of the legislative branch. Um, so, you know, all of you here who are his students are tremendously uh, fortunate, I think, to have him as your professor. Um, okay, well, among the book's many contributions I would, uh, I would highlight um, uh, are its, its kind of integrative capacities. It brings together uh, disparate congressional powers, as you've heard, into a kind of uniform uh, or unified portrait um, showing how the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, I don't know of any other work that uh, links together Congress's various hard and soft powers uh, in, that, in that fashion. Um, it seamlessly, we seamlessly weaves together political science uh, literature and constitutional theory um, with great sophistication and skill. Um, and it brings together quite deep history with current events um, to create a, a gripping and uh, uh, very readable narrative, the sort of thing that could fire up say, uh, Alyssa Milano, uh, who, as you may know, um, has been tweeting Josh's book um, with great fervor. Um, the, result, the result is the, the most uh, comprehensive, um, coherent, uh, synthetic account of Congress's role in the constitutional system that I think, that I think we have. Um, now, <laughs> I'm going to spend the rest of my time raising uh, some, some criticisms and, and concerns uh, in the way of these, these sorts of uh, events. Um, but I just want to be clear up front that I think there's, there's much to celebrate here and indeed that the book is, is pretty much indispensable for those of us who work on the separation of powers or on congressional power. Um, okay, I'm going to focus my uh, concerns or questions about the book's theory of uh, the separation of powers. You've heard a little bit about it from David. Um, I'll go further. Um, Josh calls it a, a multiplicity-based theory. That's his term uh, of the separation of powers that sees the separation of powers as, as ultimately founded on and perpetually rerouted through uh, processes of political contestation in, in the public sphere. Unlike uh, so-called formalist theories, which you may have seen in the classroom, um, Josh's theory of separation of powers emphasizes the fluidity and contingency of interbranch interaction. Uh, and unlike standard so-called functionalist theories of separation of powers, uh, Josh emphasizes the central ongoing role of political argument and public opinion in shaping and reshaping uh, the options that government actors have. Um, it is, I, I, I submit, this focus on discourse that uh, most signally distinguishes uh, Josh's theory of separation of powers. Um, it's, I think, a fundamentally discursive account of how separation of powers works, always institutionally cited uh, in Josh's terms and always historically conditioned, uh, but fundamentally the separation of powers we get is the product of the exchange of claims that are made in the public sphere. Um, that's the basic structure of Josh's theory. Um, let me suggest, though, that if, if this is the best way to understand uh, what the book is up to, um, I think it raises a number of, of challenges um, uh, for, um, for Josh and, and for all of us trying to build on his work. Okay, the first set of challenges I think it raises has to do with um, the burdens of a discursive theory um, as a kind of descriptive, descriptive account of a legal and political practice. Um, so if, if what ultimately underwrites the separation of powers is the dialectical play of constitutional politics and political arguments in the public sphere, um, then I think some new sorts of uh, explanatory variables become very relevant uh, beyond the sorts of considerations that you normally see constitutional scholars attend to. Uh, considerations relating to things like uh, the structure of public opinion formation um, on constitutional issues. Just how does the public come to a view on any constitutional matter um, uh, uh, in general and on specific sorts of issues that Josh takes up? Uh, in addition, the role of mediating institutions in civil society, like news outlets and think tanks, um, 
uh, also become very relevant, I think. You know, just what, what, are, what, how do those institutions translate what comes out of Washington um, into uh, messages that the public receives and then in turn uh, uh, mediate the relationship back to government um, when the public comes to a view on them? Uh, and then more generally, I would say, uh, what are the mechanisms through which public discourse and opinion influence decision making in Washington as well as public trust in the populace? Um, are, are, is another set of variables that we have to think about. Um, even if the public or some segment of the public comes to a, uh, a view on some issue of constitutional politics, um, just exactly how does that view translate into um, new incentives uh, for uh, political actors in Washington um, is another complex question that um, I think a discursive theory uh, needs to take up. And without having a, a kind of detailed sociological grasp of these dynamics, uh, I think it's just hard. It's hard to know how constitutional discourse actually, actually works in practice, um, how it informs and how it is in turn informed by uh, constitutional politics and, and policy. Let me make this a little bit more concrete by suggesting that uh, I think a striking omission in the book uh, is the media. Uh, um, you might think that, that the media would be um, a key actor uh, in a book that lays out a discursive theory of how constitutional politics uh, works, and that issues like uh, media concentration, uh, um, the norms of political journalism, uh, the rise of C-SPAN in the 1970s in covering congressional uh, hearings and votes, um, the rise of partisan media since the 1970s um, and the sorting of media markets and the filter bubble. Um, you might think that things like that to do with the media and its evolution uh, uh, would, um, would matter a lot to, you know, uh, uh, in their relationship to politics and in the way that um, uh, the discourse of constitutional politics plays out. Um, and, and, and I think that they must. Um, uh, but that's, that's, uh, that's not really a set of subjects that the book uh, takes up um, uh, as a focus. So I'll, I'll just suggest here that, that Josh has, I think, been truly pathbreaking uh, in pointing us toward the possibility of a discursive, uh, almost Habermasian uh, account of the separation of powers. Um, uh, but I want to suggest here that a whole new, whole new sort of analysis, uh, really beyond the competence of traditional legal scholars, uh, might be needed to fully flesh out what, what Josh has started uh, in this front, to take seriously the idea of um, a discursive theory of the separation of powers. Okay, second challenge related um, that I think the, uh, is presented by the book's theory uh, is um, can a discursive uh, multiplicity-based theory of separation of powers uh, generate predictions? Can it generate predictions? That, if that's something we want out of, out of an attractive theory of separation of powers. Well, you know, if political contestation is, is all important and if public will formation is, is really murky and contextual, um, how will we ever know uh, what to make of the, of the moment you know, we're in? Uh, well, here, as, as David suggested, uh, the book relies pretty heavily on the idea of uh, judiciousness. Um, that becomes an important uh, uh, concept in, in the book. And uh, uh, Josh kind of contends that judicious uses of institutional power will tend to redound to that institution's benefit, whereas injudicious uses of power uh, will, will tend to backfire. Um, without a theory of judiciousness, though, um, I think the fear here is that it becomes a kind of ex post, uh, almost tautological label um, for moves that seem to work out pretty well. <laughs> you know, uh, when one branch did a certain thing that seems to get rewarded uh, politically, um, we can call that judicious. Um, that's, that's not the kind of construct that could organize action or prediction ex ante, necessarily, um, uh, unless you have a theory, again, of what judiciousness looks like a priori, which the book disclaims. Uh, moreover, um, is it really plausible that uh, ju judiciousness is what the American public uh, uh, tends to reward? Um, you know, it's comforting, uh, it's comforting to think so, but the last I checked, we have a, a wildly undisciplined, um, intemperate, and, and in the view of many, uh, moral monster you know, in, in the White House. And whatever happened in 2016 in the elections, I, I think it's hard to see it as a triumph of judiciousness. Um, th 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 there's a serious point here. I, mean, I don't mean just to uh, bash on, on President Trump, but just to highlight that it's not clear, I think, that the American public always wants and rewards judiciousness, however we define that. 
um, or that, therefore, that being judicious is always the optimal strategy for a rational political actor. Um, again, I just think there are complicated questions here of uh, public preferences, political incentives, uh, media coverage, um, and the kind of game theoretic interactions of uh, actors in Washington. Uh, and the upshot is uh, I'm not sure how much um, guidance we can take from um, the idea of judiciousness or uh, multiplicity-based separation of powers for either politicians or observers who, who want to know what officials uh, uh, will do, should do, or are likely to do, and with what success um, in a given separation of powers conflict. Um, okay, lastly, the third, the third challenge I think the theory raises, these are all related in a bundle, um, is, is how, how can it ground normativity? Um, I think a discursive theory faces uh, special challenges when it comes to motivating prescriptions or critiques. Because um, it's, not, it's, it's not really clear what, what its normative uh, lodestar would be. Um, unless, unless you married it to some other sort of account of constitutional interpretation or legitimacy or morality. And I, I would suggest that the book's a little, um, a little hazy here. Um, indeed, I initially read it as a kind of critical legal studies uh, text. Um, uh, I've told Josh, Josh this. And, uh, Josh, uh, uh, you know, doesn't present as a crit uh, because the book, uh, b both his sartorial choices and uh, um, uh, because the book lavishes so much attention on, on history and institutional detail, and because uh, there's not and there's also nothing obviously kind of lefty about about the intervention. Uh, but at the end of the day, again, Josh is showing us just how little, how very little of our constitutional order is determined by law um, or by traditional legal sources alone. Uh, and how very much of it is politically constructed um, and informed, you know, that's a kind of classic uh, crit um, deconstructive move. Um, except that uh, Josh isn't content to leave it there, uh, and that, that crit work, I, again, I emphasize, is, is terrifically well done in the book. Um, uh, uh, Josh d doesn't quite leave it there, but rather um, wants to say that even though I've revealed that the separation of powers is not something to be reified, you know, but it rather is this kind of endlessly contestable, uh, contested matrix for politics, um, uh, Josh doesn't go the crit route of just saying, I've opened your eyes to that, and uh, let's attend more closely to the hidden power dynamics you know, lurking in the system. Rather, he urges judiciousness and uh, some very specific institutional reforms uh, as well. And I think the question that's raised there is, is just what, what would ground what would ground those reforms uh, um, unless, we, you know, unless we have a, a kind of prior theory of what makes for a better or worse constitutional argument or maneuver? Um, and that's not something that a discursive theory of the separation of powers can, can supply. Um, finally, I'll say, and uh, at the end of the book, uh, we get what um, David called a, a, a sophisticated optimism about kind of where we are a, as a constitutional order right now. Um, and so um, here, too, I think the same problems arise uh, as to normativity um, that arise with the specific reforms that the book commends. Um, beyond those kind of specific reforms that, that the book suggests would be uh, advisable, um, overall, the book steps back in the conclusion and suggests that we're actually in a pretty good, pretty good place. Um, the, uh, uh, not only is our system multiplicity-based, uh, but it turns out that a multiplicity-based system is a pretty good one to be in. Um, uh, with Congress's broad tool, broad set of tools playing a key role in anchoring it, um, a pretty good one because it, it conduces to representation, deliberation, anti-tyranny, and other uh, attractive uh, values. Now, David and Kurt raised uh, questions about congressional motivation to use the tools that it has at its disposal as a potential problem to realizing what might be uh, uh, salutary about a multiplicity-based system. Um, let me just go one step further and, and, and add that I think we also need a theory of, of what a good constitutional order looks like um, to, to be able to pass judgment on our multiplicity-based system uh, uh, more, more generally. Um, I think the book points us to public argument uh, and to legislative powers other than the power to legislate as key planks uh, uh, in, um, what, you know, in this kind of, uh, uh, in, in any account of what our separation power system is doing and in an attractive normative reconstruction of our system. Uh, but my hope is that future theorists will, will build on uh, the book's invaluable ground clearing work in drawing attention to those planks in the system uh, to offer what I think will need to be a more comprehensive uh, uh, first principles normative count of what we want out of separation of powers um, 
uh, learning again from what Josh has taught all of us. Thank you. Um, well, I think the most uh, uh, important thing I want to say here is uh, just thank you. Um, first of all, thank you to uh, Dean Panyover and to, the, uh, to everyone uh, at the law school for, for uh, setting this up, especially uh, Emily McFarland and Liz Flint for handling the logistics. Um, thank you to all of you for turning out. Um, I especially gratified to see a large turnout from my 1Ls, whom I did not tell had to be here. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, and uh, uh, especially, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, thank you to the uh, amazing panelists um, who uh, who've engaged so carefully with this work. Um, uh, all all four of you, um, uh, uh, Aziz and the and the three panelists as well, are people whose work I've learned a tremendous amount from, and um, uh, so it means a, a great deal to me to have you. Uh, uh, not only sort of reading and engaging with this work, but also uh, making the trip here to, to talk about it. So thank you. Um, I'm tempted to just shut up with that, because uh, uh, honestly, that's um, uh, most of what I want to say. But I do want to respond to sort of just a few of the uh, broader uh, points that, that have been raised over the course of uh, uh, people's remarks. Um, so uh, uh, David Bateman sort of uh, uh, raised this question about um, uh, what he called the, sophis the sophisticated optimism, and I appreciate the, uh, the adjective, um, the sophisticated optimism of, of my uh, discussion of engagement in the public sphere. And I want to be clear, and this is something that uh, Kurt also mentioned uh, too in describing it as an optimistic account. You know, I do try to say in the introduction of the book that I, I don't think we should regard this as a, holy, as a happy story, right? We should regard this as a story that gives us the potential for happiness, right? We should regard this as a story that tells us uh, what uh, um, and I'll come back to this, what sort of judicious actors could make of the institutional tools at their disposal, uh, but not one that suggests that at any point in time, much less this point in time, uh, they are making good use of those tools, right? So this is not uh, a, a story that about everything being well in the halls of our national legislature, far from it. Um, but nevertheless, there is this question uh, uh, that, that uh, David raises, uh, David Bateman raises, um, about uh, uh, what engagement in the public sphere can accomplish, what it would look like. And he takes, uh, uh, he gives the sort of very interesting example uh, that I do talk about a little bit in the book uh, of the Garland nomination. Um, Garland nomination is one of those sort of two places in the book where I actually was able to convince the press to let me make a couple of changes after the election results came in. Um, but the final pages were due back to the press in January. Um, so, um, you know, he, he says that the, the interesting thing about the Garland nomination is that the uh, engagement in the public sphere took the form of no engagement in the public sphere. That is, of preventing uh, confirmation hearings. But that's not quite how I describe it, right? So it, it did take the form of preventing confirmation hearings in the halls of Congress. But um, not only uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, but also a number of Democrats running for competitive Senate seats tried to make a big deal. Out of um, uh, out of the holdup of Garland, right? There were numerous ad campaigns run not only by Democratic Senate candidates themselves, but also by uh, outside groups uh, claiming, you know, about how Republican senators were trying to hold a seat open for Donald Trump, and this was back when that was thought to be a losing argument. Um, the problem is that Democrats lost that argument, right? The problem is, is that they lost the pol the public politics of the Garland nomination. They were unable to convince uh, enough voters to care about. Uh, 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 who, who appointed the next justice, or potentially uh, they convinced enough voters to care to want a Republican to appoint the next justice. Right? But I wouldn't describe that as something where there was no public politics of it. Instead, I would describe it as something where the Democrats tried to uh, win the public politics of it and, in fact, lost the public politics of it. Um, I, I think that uh, the, 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 the issue, though, that that, that that gets to, and this is also something that David raised, is that um, the public is not a monolithic thing. Right? Uh, we should not talk about sort of engagement with the public, but rather engagement with the publics. Um, and this also goes to, to, I think, David Posen's first point, um, which is we have to think about the, uh, we, we can't treat engagement in the public sphere. And by the way, I, I realize engagement in the public sphere is a somewhat sort of wordy uh, locution. The reason I use that instead of public opinion is precisely for the reasons that David Posen points to. I want this to be uh, not something that uh, 
sounds in sort of snapshot polling or uh, uh, claims that sort of things are precisely measurable or that is inattentive to the power dynamics within the public at large, right? Not everybody's voice counts the same as a descriptive matter in American politics, and I'm certainly not blind to that. I think Dave Posen is absolutely right that, um, you know, were I to uh, take this 450-page book and turn it into a 900-page book, a big part of what I would have to do is uh, say more about what happens when these things go out to the public. I do try to say a little bit about that, especially when, in talking about uh, the speech or debate clause and the way that, um, for example, uh, uh, members of Congress's ability to leak state secrets plays out in public. Um, but you're right, there is a lot more to be said there, and I um, look forward to uh, uh, being able to say more about that and hopefully having other people uh, join the conversation uh, about that uh, as well. But it does, I think, point to this idea that there are, that, that in talking about engagement with the public, you have to talk about engagements with the publics um, and think about the sort of way that that creates political cleavages and different institutional dynamics in sort of interesting and important ways. And I think that's a really uh, nice observation. Um, in, uh, uh, in, in, in Kurt's remarks, I took the sort of core of them, there's a, there's a lot there, there's a lot in all, th uh, all three of these sets of remarks, way more than I can sort of dig into here. But I took the core of sort of Kurt's remark uh, to be the argument, we don't have a Madisonian Congress, right? Um, uh, that we don't have uh, a Congress that is institutionally structured so that ambition will counteract ambition. Um, and I think that is right for a certain kind of reading of a Madisonian Congress, but I think it's, I think Madison, uh, or Madisonianism can be made consistent with the Congress that we have. Um, which is to say, um, if you think that the idea that ambition has to counteract, or that ambition should counteract ambition means that people have to act in the interests of their branch rather than uh, partisan interests, then for the most part I accept that we do not have a Madisonian Congress. I think it's often overstated the extent to which we do not have that. I think um, when you look at things more closely, you do see situations in which not only individual members of Congress, but also individual, but also entire houses of Congress act in their collective interests. Um, uh, but it's, it's certainly not their, their sort of do dominant mode of behavior. But one of the things I try to uh, sort of suggest throughout the book um, uh, and in this, uh, I'm, I'm actually picking up on some very uh, important work uh, in the federalism context by Jessica Bullman Posen. Um, what I try to suggest uh, uh, throughout the book is that there are um, ways in, that the, the, the tools that members or houses of the legislature have are sort of tools that exist there regardless of their motivation for using them such that it might be a partisan motivation for, say, opposing the president, or for that matter, for working with the president. But um, regardless of what's motivating them, they have these tools available to them. And so if you have a House of Representatives, say, in the hands of the Republican Party, and you have a president who is a Democrat, um, then they are, there are all kinds of things that that House can do to push back against the president. Um, and that it may be doing them because they're, you know, they're Republicans and he's a Democrat, um, but that doesn't change the fact that Congress is exerting itself and exercising significant amounts of authority. Um, that uh, uh, then ties into the argument that I make that, that Kurt noted, um, which is that um, when they're not, when we don't have that situation, right, when we have uh, what is often called unified government, um, we may not want to see as much pushback, right? Uh, and Kurt says, well, that's, that's true, but we might still want to see it in, in situations where there are truly things that we would want to regard as abuses. And I agree with that, and I actually think uh, one of the things we're seeing right now is that in a situation that would normally be characterized as unified government, we are seeing significant congressional pushback against an administration, largely on the grounds that, that, that uh, the administration is being perceived to do things that, uh, that, that people of both parties, or at least that enough people of both parties, uh, think are uh, not just sort of policy differences, but, but actually uh, abusive. Um, one thing that, that I think uh, was, was, uh, came up in, in both Kurt's and, and David Bateman's uh, comments is, is this idea of sort of low congressional approval ratings, and that's certainly true. Um, uh, David said that, that uh, Congress's approval ratings dipped during the 70s when, when Congress was being most aggressive, and that is true, uh, but uh, Congress's approval ratings dipped less than everyone else's approval ratings did in the 70s, right? So, Cong I mean, in, in terms of the differential, for example, between congressional and presidential approval ratings, right, the streams crossed in the 70s. There was a while when Congress was more popular than the president, even on the sort of standard measures of congressional approval. 
Uh, and that takes me to the sort of next point, which is that the, the, the congressional approval questions, in my view, are useless. Um, uh, that is to say, they prime people to think about the wrong things. Um, so this is uh, what political scientists talk about as Fenno's paradox. Uh, the, it's commonly phrased as the idea that um, people hate Congress, but they love their congressmen. Um, right? So you ask people, do you approve of Congress? You know, 15% say yes. You ask people, do you approve of your congressman? 65, 75% of them say yes. Um, so. Um, uh, so there is a, you know, and, and I think you can see this in other ways too. So if you ask people, uh, you know, do you like Congress? Nobody says yes. If you ask people, do you approve of congressional budget proposals or the president's budget proposals? They'll be split roughly 50-50, right? So that suggests that Congress is not necessarily at a sort of absolute disadvantage in public sphere competition with the executive branch or with any other branch. It suggests that what uh, uh, that, that Congress needs to, and members of Congress need to frame it to sort of highlight the ways in which they have a public advantage. And this goes back to this idea that the way that power is uh, divvied up among the branches has to do with their, the success of their discursive engagement. So to the extent that they're putting out this, there the story, uh, hey, we're Congress, trust us, right? We're, we're, here for, we're, we're from Congress and we're here to help. Uh, that is clearly the wrong way for Congress to go about it. On the other hand, to the extent that they uh, can, can uh, that they're sort of engaging either with their own constituents and, hey, you know, I'm the guy who's been retail campaigning in this neighborhood for 20 years, trust me, or, um, hey, don't you think our budget proposal looks better than theirs or our proposal on health care or whatever looks better uh, than the other guys, uh, then uh, they, they actually sort of have a chance. And we see this not infrequently, right? It's, it's simply not the case that presidents uh, unilaterally or even close to unilaterally determine American public policy. Congress is a major player in the system, and that power has to come uh, from somewhere. Um, on, um, uh, so the, the, the last thing I want to uh, talk about uh, before uh, shutting up is uh, uh, a couple of points that, that Dave Posen made. One is this question of, um, and this is also something I think that, that David Bateman talked about, this question of judiciousness, and um, uh, uh, David Posen framed it as, sorry, it's too many Davids. Uh, David Posen framed it as this question of whether, um, uh, whether the work is sort of capable of generating uh, predictions. And part of what, um, I'm tempted to say no and leave it at that, but I, I'm not going to. Um, so one of the reasons that I tell in the book such uh, sort of uh, thick and detailed and, and perhaps overly detailed uh, historical stories is because I think that quite, I think you can't talk about these things in anything even remotely approaching the abstract. I think you really uh, need to have a really sort of thickly grounded sense of the political circumstances. Um, I think this is a sort of Weberian instinct that, that, that politics is a vocation, that there is a certain thing as political skill that what a good politician does is sort of a certain kind of exercise of practical judgment uh, in uh, taking the political circumstances as she finds them and manipulating them to her advantage. Um, so I don't think that uh, what I'm talking, so not only do I not think I can generate large scale predictions, I think this is a sort of anti-predictive work in that uh, sense. I think that is to say it suggests that no one can generate large scale long term predictions uh, about the uh, distribution of power, uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't generate short-term local predictions, right? It means that you sort of, uh, but, but those predictions will always be deeply contingent and deeply grounded in the circumstances in which political actors find themselves. Um, and then the last question is, can this ground normativity or am I a closet crit? Um, kinda. Um, <laughs> um, but I think that there is, you know, I, I, I do want to do something more than, than uh, this sort of purely uh, deconstructive project. And this sort of ties into um, the conclusion, right? So the conclusion, um, uh, uh, as you note, sort of uh, takes a little bit more of a normative turn than the rest of the book, right? I think, of mo I think of the first 400 and whatever, 60 pages of it as being basically positive in character uh, and then uh, uh, sort of uh, a, a, a normative turn. Uh, in the conclusion, um, and and because it's it's literally conclusory, you know, it's not uh, as as well grounded as um, you or even uh, I might like. Um, but I do think the sort of implicit theory of what a good constitutional order would look like in there is, uh, in some sense, a, a sort of procedural one, right? It is it's one that focuses not only on. Um, discourse, because discourse can cash out in a lot of different ways, but focuses specifically on the idea that political disagreement and political difference is intractable and inevitable, right? It will always be with us, it should always be with us, because um, uh, we don't have a sort of 
uniformly agreed upon hierarchy of values and politics is, among other things, the play of, of values. Um, given that, uh, I think the normative virtue in a system of separated powers, and, and part of what's going on in the conclusion is it's sort of an uh, implicit rejoinder to a turn in the literature in the last 20 years or so that suggests that we should just throw out the separation of powers and move towards uh, something more like a parliamentary system. So this is something I associate most closely with someone like Sandy Levinson. Um, uh, and the, the rejoinder to that is, essentially that forces sort of decision making into a sort of single flat plane, right? And what I'm suggesting is the virtue of uh, a system of separated powers, especially one that's understood to have the kind of play in the joints that, that I believe characterizes uh, the American system, is that it allows for the con sort of continual unending clash of and negotiation among competing values. It allows uh, d people with different views to capture different levers of power and then to use those institutions against each other. And then what results from that, the sort of policy and politics that results from that, uh, is going to be unsatisfying to everyone, right? And that's great. Right? It's going to, that is to say, nobody's ever going to win a final political victory. No one's ever going to win a complete political victory. Uh, but instead, everybody's going to get an nth of a loaf, uh, uh, where n is deeply conditioned by the kinds of power dynamics that Dave Posen wants me to talk more about. Um, so I think, um, I think it can ground, again, a sort of, uh, I hesitate to use the word procedural, but I can't think of a better synonym at the moment, so a sort of procedural normativity, uh, if, not, uh, if not a substantive one. Um, so that is all I'm going to say about that, uh, except again, thank you very much all for coming, and thank, oh, all of you very much for, for your incredible <laughs>